Hello, it is Tuesday, January 4th, 2022. I'm Chris Remo, and welcome back to the New York Times Crossword Daily Solve for the first Tuesday puzzle of 2022. Of course, another another early week, fairly gentle crossword, I would imagine. Um, and this particular puzzle, or at least this solve of it, I should say, is brought to you by Stephanie Fredericks, Dan Stoko, and as always, the inestimable Hood Monster. So thank you so much to all three of them, benefactors of the Daily Solve Patreon campaign. And thank you to everybody who has pledged the Patreon campaign at any tier. I very much appreciate it. If you'd like to join their ranks, the benefactor level or any other, you can head over to patreon.com slash daily solve. And there you can get access to the whole wealth of um, months of bonus videos I've recorded, including just uh, yesterday, I think I put up the latest round of community created crosswords. I solved seven crosswords from the uh, Daily Solve Discord chat server, the Constructor's Corner channel. And I think it was five mini crosswords, one sort of mid-sized crossword, bigger than I think what's called a midi, and uh, one full-sized crossword. They were all very good. There were some incredibly, incredibly clever things in there. There was one called Controversial that uh, had a very clever gimmick that I won't spoil if you have not seen it. Anyway, uh, you can solve all of all of those yourself as well. There, are, um, If you're a patron of the campaign, there are links in the, in the description field underneath the video. Otherwise, you could simply join the Daily Serve, Daily Solve um, Discord chat server with the link underneath the video and browse the Constructor's Corner channel. Anyway, um, all that said, let's discuss a few comments from yesterday's puzzle. There weren't really many uh, corrections, per se, I don't think. Uh, just, I think, mainly observations. So, oh, well, I, should, <laughs> I guess I was sort of curious about the full interpretation of the theme in yesterday's puzzle around the notion of gut feelings. And they were things like dread and pity and, oh, uh, I don't even remember all of them, but uh, love, I think, was in there. Anyway, um, the point was doesn't necessarily matter what the particular particular words were. I wasn't really sure I fully understood what made those particular emotions gut feelings. And Chris Lavornia says, all of the emotions are in the middle of their answers. They're in the gut of the answer, he hence gut feelings. So that must be it. I mean, I think that's a, that's a great interpretation, and I'm certain it's correct. I was still wondering if there was something about those particular emotions that made them suitable, but I think... I think uh, Chris Lavornia has has pretty much nailed it. Uh, Any Prophet also says, I had mentioned that there seems to be a disparity between the frequency of ETA for estimated time of arrival or ETD, estimated time of departure, or their respective plural forms, or at least commenters have pointed out a disparis, disparity. And Any Prophet says, there are about 1,500 instances of ETA or ETAs. Doing some rough, rough math and filtering out clues for the Greek letter, the total is still about 1,100. Alternatively, there are 170 instances of ETD or ETDs, so there's a definite bias for ETA over ETD, which is interesting because that that sort of proves the extent to which that word is a bit of crossword ease that's just used to get some letters in there, because realistically at the airport, generally speaking, ETD, estimated time of departure, is going to be a much more useful and important number because that's when your plane leaves. And so there's a deadline on that. It's, you absolutely cannot miss that time. Whereas estimated time of arrival is more of a guideline for somebody picking someone up from the airport. It's not quite as important as an ETD. So anyway, George Adams tacked on a comment to that on a on a related note of answer frequency of a different sort, one thing I've noticed in non-New York Times crosswords is a very large bias, perhaps 25 to 1, for feminine Spanish adjectives over masculine ones, e.g. esta instead of esto. I think the same bias extends to the New York Times puzzle, but to a much smaller degree. That's interesting. I think I've probably noticed that as well, although I wouldn't have, it wouldn't really have occurred to me if, if it hadn't been pointed out. I suppose that speaks to the prevalence of the letter A in English over the letter O. Again, these things are largely there to fill in space in the grid. Anyway, I think that's um, 
let's just get on to today's crossword. How about that? As I said earlier, it's a Tuesday puzzle, so probably a fairly gentle one. There will be some kind of theme, and it looks like we've got, I don't know, is this maybe a person illustrated in the crossword? It looks like little feet at the bottom of the grid, and maybe arms slightly outstretched, and then a big head at the top. It looks like it might be. I'm not really sure. Um, or I suppose the could be arms on the side and then a skirt or dress. I don't know. Could be nothing. Anyway, <laughs> it's, uh, it is symmetrical about a vertical axis, which is not so not as common as radial symmetry. This crossword is constructed by David Buxbon, and this is uh, this constructor's debut in the New York Times crossword, and edited, as always, by Will Shorts. So let's get going. Okay. Upper left keyboard button, speaking of abbreviations to fill space, escape, ESC. And George of Hail Caesar, that was George Clooney in the Coen Brothers film, Hail Caesar. Lead into mania, could be egomania, and a risque costume for a holiday party. Um, could be sexy something. What about, let's look at the crosses. Yes, aloe vera product is gel, and a kitchen gadget brand is OXO or OXO, which is correct. And here we have, ah, oh, wow. So we have, a, oh, we haven't had a quote theme in a while. This is something, this is a kind of theme that comes up in the crossword from time to time, but I haven't really seen it recently where we'll have a quote that threads through several answers and then by 57 across, we will then get the source of the quotation. So that'll be, uh, that'll be fun. So I bet this is you. I bet this, I bet this starts with the word Y-O-U. Edit menu option, yes, indeed. The edit menu on many computer applications includes the command undo. And here a kind of diagram that the MasterCard logo resembles, Venn diagram, the two overlapping circles, such as in the MasterCard um, logo. Letters on a bottle of brandy could be VSO, the grading, uh, the grading scheme of brandy. It's what, VS, VSO, and VSOP? And snow day toys, sleds, of course. Ah, uh, risque costume for holiday. Oh, I see for a holiday party, sexy elf. I think for some reason I, <laughs> I interpreted this as a Halloween costume for some reason, even though that's not specified in the clue because I don't know costumes, Halloween, and then I it didn't. So I was thinking it could be any number of things, but anyway, it would be a sexy elf, I guess. Holiday in this case, meaning the sort of Christmas time holiday. So start of an optimistic quote, right? Starts with you and then maybe of you or of your here, probably still the letter U. Black in his reputa reputation, indeed, Sully, a reputation. So this could be of your, yes, caviar, fish eggs could be row, and smooches. Love ya, maybe? Pop yeah, maybe. Poppy's, Popeye's Olive, the character, the cartoon character, Olive Oil. And here we have Almost Too Smooth. Not sure about that, but let's, we've got some good crosses here. Sports Bar Array. TVs, I suppose, in a sports bar. And Blank Speedwagon, REO Speedwagon, uh, the band named after the car, car model, I suppose. Of your... Oh, I don't know. I'm going to need more crosses. Let's let's go back up and solve the crossword. How about that? Ordinarily. Hinders as one style. Cramps one style, as they say. Rogan of Superbad, and this is the end, would be the actor Seth Rosen, uh, Rogan. So I have a friend named Seth Rosen, and I've conflated the two. Entertain lavishly. Um, I'm not sure. Foam clog. Foam clog. And make a long story short. Recap. Maybe you could recap a story to make it short. School groups without students could be PTAs, parent-teacher associations. Bond is a special one, a special agent, James Bond. Island nation uh, south of Sicily, um, Malta. So to entertain lavishly could be to regale... And a spotted wildcat could be an ocelot. And schemes are plots. This is coming together pretty quickly. So this looks like you can't, perhaps. Foam clog. Oh, croc. Oh, a shoe. Foam clog. So it did occur to me that clog might be referring to 
to footwear, but I couldn't bring to mind the brand name Croc, and that's what it is, type of shoe or brand of shoe. You can't think, maybe? You can't, something that starts with TH, I bet it's think. Let's just try it and see. Poetic foot with a short and long syllable. That would be an iamb, as in iambic pentameter, which is made up of iams, which are the um, short and long syllable, in other words, unstressed and stressed. So um, how now, my cousin, is the day so young? That's iambic pentameter. He'd be a broader guy if he had dropped blank once. <laughs> Steve Jobs on Bill Gates' acid, I suppose? He'd be a broader guy if he had dropped acid once, said Steve Jobs on Bill Gates, I suspect. And here's Des Moines, Iowa, the city. And strike from the Bible. So we have a question mark here. So there's a, that's the pun indicator. There's something punny going on. We're not meant to read this literally. And in this case, it'll be, um, I think what that, what we're meant to take from that is that strike is, we're, we're, we're saying, how do we literally say strike from the Bible? Um, we're not using the noun, a strike from the Bible. We're using the verb strike in its biblical, at least how it's often translated in the Bible, to smite. Okay, artist's shortcut. A stencil, I suppose, tracing a stencil. And an airborne toy with no tail. A kite of some kind? What kind of kite? Federal loan agency. Um, is this student loans with the S? Number one could be the top. Screenplay abbreviation indicating outside would be exterior. Like Usain Bolt's last name is apt because obviously Usain Bolt is a very fast person. Um, airborne toy with no tail. I actually don't... <laughs> Boy, I feel silly for getting stuck at this point in a Tuesday crossword, but... What is this? Airborne toy with no tail. Rocks kite? And then what is this one? This is Federal Loan Agency. Is this a box kite? That's actually, that's sort of, I've seen kites that look like boxes. I bet it's that. And this would be then probably the small business agency. Do they give small business loans? I'm actually not 100% not certain, but if I had to bet, I would bet on box kite and SBA. Let's remember that that could be the problem if the crossword doesn't validate and keep going. So you can think of your troubles, this clearly reads. And here we have almost too smooth. So this could be suave as in a person. That person's suave. They're almost too smooth. They're verging on being suspiciously smooth. So you can think of your troubles... This looks like solve, solvers or solving. That would be appropriate to the crossword. Uh, let's look at this down and see if we can disambiguate that. It makes a clink in a drink. Ah, ice. So maybe solving. I bet solving is the part of the quotation here. So we have, you can think of your troubles. I'm not sure what that first word is, actually. Make it known that you know someone well-known well. Make it well-known that you know someone well-known well. Known well. Uh, that's a very funny way to refer to name-dropping. Many a city street layout is a grid, particularly in the United States. Big name in the freezer aisle is ED, the ice cream moniker. And here's a case where the name, I think the brand name is EDs with the possessive S, but here the big name in the freezer aisle isn't referring to the brand name, but rather the, presumably, person's surname that is the namesake of the brand. Anyway, like some humor in martinis, some humor is dry and some martini is dry, and those two things feel like they go together somehow. You could make a dry joke with your, rye, with your dry martini. Kuwaiti ruler would be in a mirror that looks right. And a virtual holiday greeting is an e-card. Uh, boy, it's actually been a long time, I think, since we've gotten a full-on E-word. At least I can't remember it coming up very recently. But here is one, E-card. And I know there is a brand E-card, so I, or no, maybe that's E-greeting. Anyway, whatever. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't been able to rant and rave about E-words recently. A knockoff, I don't know, a phony maybe, a phony 
a bootleg thing. Popular Sammy. So this will be a an abbreviated sandwich because Sammy here is obviously a an informal term for a sandwich. So we'll be using some kind of informal or contracted or abbreviated form of a sandwich. So it could be a BLT, for instance. Um, but I'm not sure. Mind blown. I don't know. It could be the word epic. That's epic. Wow, mind blown. Um, sorry, uh, just adjusting my camera a bit. I don't think that's correct, though. Knock off cranberry farms, uh, bogs. Cranberries are br- grown in bogs, aren't they? And a popular Sammy. Oh, PBJ, maybe? Peanut butter and jelly. And never liked those. Anyway, shoot the breeze. Um, jaw. You could say we, that's, that's not really something that I hear or say often, but I do think you can use jaw to mean kind of shoot the breeze, to gab, to chat. Uh, mind blown is the word woe, which <laughs> I strenuously maintain is spelled W-H-O-A and not the alternative you often see, which is W-O-A-H. Wow. Which looks like, wow. It looks like how um, French dogs bark to me. Okay. Anyway. Ah, you can think of your troubles while solving. This, I wonder if this is a, this must be a crossword quote. At least I suspect it's going to be. You can think of your troubles while solving. I bet this will be the crossword. Oh no, it's not. Uh, darn. Um, well, it could be crosswords, could it? Because name drop. Name, make it well known that you know someone well known well. Name, I don't know, that really seems like name drop. Oh darn, I was hoping that would work out. Oh, but this doesn't really look now. Oh, a crossword. Ah, there we go. Why didn't that occur to me? You can think of your troubles while solving a crossword. That's the quote. (laughs) You can't, oh, you can't think of, sorry. You can't think of your troubles while solving a crossword. You know what? I think that's kind of true. You, You have to be pretty much engaged on this thing the whole time you're doing it. Even if you solve it quickly, at least for that duration of time, you'll be pretty much focused on the crossword. And this is kind of nice, to be honest. One with access. uh, Oh, ones with access. Sorry, I keep keep missing tenses. Ins, I suppose, the in crowd. And so a knockoff is indeed a phony. And here, school where students... Oh, I thought this might have been hogwash or something. But no, I think students... School where students learn to spell. This would be Hogwarts from Harry Potter, the school from Harry Potter. I do know some things about Harry Potter, and one of them is that I've heard of Hogwarts. Movie FX CGI, computer-generated imagery, and NBA team with a gorilla mascot, strangely enough. Um, so I'm guessing this is going to be a team with a different animal name or something. Word after booty or Bermuda shorts. Oops. That's a fun cross with a crossword. Maybe a maybe a, a a sly reference to Will Shorts, perhaps. NBA team with a gorilla mascot. Strangely enough, um, I I don't know. <laughs> Spiffy, and here we have sixty minuti, so sixty minutes in Italian, I would think. Ora for hour. Spiffy could be. Oh, nice, or oh, neat, or oh, cool. I mean, it feels though it could be many things. Ode title starter. Ah, so in addition to an E word, we've got a reference to an ode, but what I very much appreciate that ode is used in a clue rather than the answer. Um, ode title starter could be for dedication. An ode is a poem about or dedicated to a person or thing, so it could be for spiffy. Oh, Oh, although actually, it doesn't look great ending this word. So it could be 2A as an ode to a Grecian urn. I always forget if that's ode 2A or on a Grecian urn. But in any case, again, 2A could be dedicated. You could dedicate a a poem to a subject. So spiffy could be oh neat, maybe. Remove from office could be to unseat, to remove from political office in particular. Parent company of lean cuisine. Nestle, maybe? I don't know. Nestle is a big food conglomerate. Maybe they own lean cuisine. I have no idea. Considered it, it considered it right to do something. Saw fit. Oh, I I forgot about the yeah, okay, I know who this is. 
So here's the source of the quote. You can't think of your troubles while solving a crossword. Margaret Ferrer. Margaret Ferrer was the first puzzle editor of the New York Times. She was, and I think remained the editor for decades, as Will Schwartz has more recently done. Um, I think there I think there have only been, probably should know this, but I, I think Will, Will Schwartz is the, it's either the fourth or fifth crossword editor. He might only be the fourth. Oh, I can't quite recall. There have not been very many, so they've had quite long tenures, and Margaret Ferrer was the first one. That's a great... So I wonder if this is meant to be a stylized person, this uh, this depiction in the grid. Because this does sort of look like a person with outstretched arms and maybe wearing a skirt or dress and then a large head. I mean, not necessarily a large head, but in the way that cartoon depictions of people often have disproportionately large heads. And then two feet at the bottom. I wonder if that's what this is. It's, all, it's also the case that these little bits could be the arms rather than a garment, but they're pretty far down. I don't know, hard to say. Anyway, maybe this is meant to be Margaret Ferrer, the source, the apparent source of the quotation, you can't think of your troubles while solving a crossword. It's a very nice sentiment. And I agree. <laughs> like a thumbs down vote. Um, not I, perhaps? Or, oh no, anti, that not I wouldn't make sense. And not I would be a thing you would say, not a, not a description of a thumbs down vote. With 58 down, words before cheese. Oh, oh, I see. Mac and cheese. That's funny. Mac and cheese. And then here we have lasers. Read them from the inside out. It would be CDs, indeed. They are read from the inside out. Um, unlike vinyl records, which are read from the outside in. Uh, here we have ankle bones. Um, Tari? Proofreaders actually don't delete this as stet. Stet is a um, proofreading term that you would add on, you would scribble next to a deletion saying, I changed my mind, don't delete this. Oh, the Suns, an NBA team with a, oh, so it's not, it makes sense that it wouldn't be an animal. That would be truly bizarre if it were a different animal other than a gorilla. But it makes sense that it's, it is strange that the team isn't the gorillas, but it's not ludicrous. Okay, parent company of lean cuisine. Oh, okay, it must be net, oh, Tolly, okay. Oh, is it like Tolly and Talos, actually, now that I think about it. And then parent company of Lean Cuisine, Nestle was correct. B&O and, and Short Line, those are railroads, probably best known to most people from the, the American version of Monopoly, which is how I know them. Uh, 66 across, Fizzy Drink is a soda pop, of course. And let's just look at the crosses before we finish the puzzle. A kerfuffle is an ado. And to bust a rhyme is to rap in that, that. Okay, so I remembered just after I clicked submit that I never, uh, I didn't have to go. I, well, I never went back and reevaluated box kite and SBA, but I was pretty confident about the box kite part. And I think this is small business agency, probably. Um, okay, well that that was the Tuesday puzzle by David Buxman. That was a very nice tribute to the first editor of the New York Times crossword. I wonder if there's a particular reason for this tribute. Um, I wonder if it was if the anniversary of her birth or her first crossword or something. I Maybe I'll just check really quickly. Maybe I'll just edit this video while I go, while I go check just in case. Okay, I'm back. Well, I guess for you, I never left, but um, I've been uh, reading up a bit on Margaret Ferrer and uh, I don't think today specifically is a um, is an anniversary of any specific note, but this year in general does actually mark the um, 80th. This is her 80th anniversary year of becoming the New York Times first uh, crossword editor, and um, indeed, Will Shorts, by the way, is the fourth editor. There was Margaret Ferrer, Will Wang, Eugene T. Maleska, and then Will Shorts, and. Uh, she's quite, she had a quite interesting history with the crossword. She actually, um, she became uh, decades before becoming the New York times crossword editor. She became the assistant crossword editor to Arthur Wynne at the New York world. And Arthur Wynne was actually the British born, but 
American resident at that point, inventor of the crossword puzzle. So Margaret Ferrer was the assistant to the original inventor of the crossword. But when she published when she published submissions, crossword submissions to uh, the paper, she didn't test them first. And uh, Wynne was sort of cross with her about this. And so she started testing the puzzles and realized that she had published some puzzles that were unsolvable. So pretty, pretty big error. But um, she rectified it quickly and then determined after that point to, quote, take an oath to edit the crosswords to the essence of perfection. And uh, eventually her puzzles became more popular than those of Wynne. And uh, it was decades until she became the editor of the New York Times crossword. Uh, the New York Times, I guess, resisted um, publishing a crossword, even though its publisher was a fan of them. And when they finally did start, Margaret Ferrer became the founding editor. And obviously, New York Times crossword became an incredibly influential staple. And the New Yorker in 1959 described her as probably the most important person in the world of the crossword puzzle. Um, there was another funny thing that that I really liked. She was the one who established who who really set in stone the convention of crosswords featuring symmetry, particularly radial symmetry. She she I guess insisted that crosswords be radial radially symmetric, unless they need to have some other form of symmetry in order to accommodate some sort of unusual theme. Which actually we can see in this puzzle. I think probably the reason it's not radially symmetrical is because we have so many of these very long answers that have to fill the grid. And it was probably quite similar. It's difficult to make that work, particularly in a in an early week puzzle um, where you're going to want a lot of short answers as well. And anyway, when asked why, why she instituted that rule, the symmetry rule, she said, because it's prettier. And I think that's a great answer. And <laughs> you shouldn't really need it to be any more uh, involved than that, because I think it is true. The grids, a, a radially symmetrical grid looks incredibly pleasing. There's something about it that just looks uh, right and it looks logical and it looks uh, aesthetically balanced. I mean, it is literally balanced and it and it it looks that way. I mean, I think a crossword that has arbitrary, often children will be given crosswords that have just sort of arbitrary grids and they don't really fit any kind of symmetrical pattern and they just look like nothing. I mean, they don't just don't, they just, you know, they're not taken seriously, I suppose, maybe because they're given to children and so they don't think the crossword needs to be beautiful. I don't know. Um, but I always found, I always find those extremely unappealing to look at. Anyway, uh, there's just some, some bits about Margaret Fair. Oh, another funny thing about Mar Margaret Fair is she published the first book. Well, she, she created the first book ever published by Simon and Schuster, the uh, well, I mean, now very, I mean, I, they started apparently as sort of a special interest publisher who would publish works for particular uh, fields of, you know, hobbies or interests or whatever. And the first book they ever published was a crossword book by Margaret Ferris. So that's quite interesting. And even that was decades before she became New York Times crossword editor or before anyone became it. Anyway, uh, just some interesting facts about a person who was uh, very influential and arguably foundational in the world of crosswords, which is obviously the subject of this series. So a person uh, without whom this series certainly would not exist. Uh, <laughs> it's a pretty minor part of her legacy, I would say. Anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed the puzzle. I hope you enjoyed that little uh, dive into Margaret Ferrer's legacy and reputation and history with the crossword. Oh, and actually, sorry, one more thing, because it actually relates directly to this theme. Apparently, the thing that eventually pushed the New York Times to finally start publishing crosswords and indeed hired, hire a crossword editor, hire, hire, hire Margaret Ferrer to oversee it, was the outbreak of World War, well, not the outbreak of World War II, but Pearl Harbor particularly, the um, involvement of the United States eventually in World War II. And it was determined that people needed some kind, uh, some additional ways to divert themselves from this uh, global catastrophe that that uh, was already unfolding, but had come closer to to uh, more American residents, and that ties in, I think, quite well with this quotation: "You can't think of your troubles while solving a crossword." Uh, true, true enough. And so there we have it. That's it. I hope you enjoyed. 
the puzzle. I hope you enjoyed the solve. And again, I hope you enjoyed that that little dip into Margaret Ferrer's uh, history and legacy. And I've gone on quite long, longer than usual in this video, so I'll, I'll wrap it up here. Um, I hope you'll be back tomorrow for the Wednesday puzzle. But until that point, please do have an excellent remainder of your Tuesday. Take care. Uh -huh.